Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I propose to do in speaking to this bill at report stage, Bill C-37, is speak to the portions and the importance of providing support for victims in my first three minutes and return in my second seven minutes to the problems that I have with this bill. Overall, I think all of us will agree that victim services provided by provinces need to be, and territories need to be expanded and improved. The title of this bill, Increasing Offenders' Accountability for Victims Act, may uh, gild the lily somewhat. This is, uh, of course, uh, a victim surcharge which is applied at the time of sentencing. But I completely concur with the words of uh, Sue O'Sullivan, the federal ombudsman for victims of crime, and, and in fact, the mo her most recent report of, of February of this year, shifting the conversation. We do need to substantially improve services to victims in this country, and it was, in fact, her recommendation that led to much of this bill. The, uh, one of the areas where I think we particularly need to help victims, and it's not one that comes up in this legislation, but it's a, a move that is supported by the Federal Ombudsman for Victims of Crime, and it's one that in this brief opening statement I want to highlight, because I think members on all sides of this House should get behind a measure that we desperately need, and that's something that was encapsulated in something called Lindsay's Law. It's not been brought forward yet. It actually relates to a tragic circumstance that happened for one of my constituents, uh, my constituent Judy Peterson, 20 years ago this year, uh, had her daughter go missing. She's never been able to find out what happened to Lindsay, but it's led her on a crusade to find a way to create a database for the DNA of missing persons that could be cross-referenced to crime scenes. Uh, everybody involved in victim services that I can find thinks that this is a worthy effort. In fact, when you go back into the records of any time the House of Commons has dealt with it, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, back in 2009, looked at this issue of the importance of a DNA Identification Act and supports it. It was also supported in the Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Unfortunately, to this point, it hasn't been brought into law. I should mention as well that uh, even more recently, the police chiefs of this country, when they were meeting in Nova Scotia in August of this year, confirmed that they believe that we need to create a database for the DNA of missing persons to be cross-referenced to crime scenes. This would be of enormous value to victims and yet is missing in this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll return to the subject of Bill C-37 after question period. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just before question period, I was speaking to the reasons that on Bill C-37 I have grave concerns. I earlier explained that this bill is titled um, the Increasing Offenders Accountability for Victims Act. It is, in fact, though, not a separate act at all. It's, it's amendments to the criminal code, and these amendments to the criminal code deal with the issue of surcharges and fines that are um, paid. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's still a little difficult to, um, to proceed. May I wait until the noise subsides? You may. Again, could we ask everyone who is not taking part in the debate this afternoon to please take their conversations outside the chamber? Uh, I cannot hear the member from Saanich Gulf Islands. Just allow another 30 seconds or so. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. I appreciate that a great deal, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, these are amendments to the criminal code, and they deal with only one thing, and that is the fine that is a surcharge that is put on a, someone who's been convicted of a criminal offense. Uh, the current surcharge is 15 percent of the amount of any fine that is assessed against someone at the point of sentencing. Uh, what's, what this act does is double that to 30 percent, which is in and of itself not a concern of mine. I think it's important that we have adequate funds for victim services. What, the, what happens to these fines, just to clarify for anyone who's watching, is they don't actually go to the victims. They go to provinces and territories where those provinces and territories are supposed to use those funds 
for victim services. This is different than the category of restitution where a convicted person actually provides funds directly to the victim of their crime. So this is a general pot of money that's supposed to go to victim services. I, I do note that some of the witnesses before committee had concern that we didn't know how, how tightly a province or territory uh, tracks those funds and applies them to victim services, but that's, that's not the, the, the thrust of most of what I want to talk about today. In t on top of doubling from 15% to 30%, uh, these amendments to the criminal code would also create an automatic $100 of fine in the case where no particular fine has been levied. Anyone guilty on summary conviction will have a levied $100. And anyone guilty of an offense punishable by indictment will have an additional fine of $200 if no fine has been levied by the judge. Now, this gets to a very difficult area, Mr. Speaker. As I said, I'm very supportive, and it's the Green Party, and I think every member in this House is supportive of victims of crime. We know that it's traumatic, even a small, relatively small criminal event is traumatic in one's life as a victim, and the more severe events can, add, can be catastrophic in one's life. So it's not for lack of concern, but one looks at the question of who's victimized in society and where are all the victims. Not all the victims are outside of our prisons. Some of the victims are inside our prisons. And this is the point I want to raise based on testimony that was heard November 1st before committee from Kim Pate, who's the executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I just want to read some of what she said into the record. She said, the majority of women in prison, 91% of indigenous women in prison, 82% of women overall, have histories of physical and or sexual abuse. Talking about a victim surcharge to assist victims, when these women end up in custody, largely because of the lack of resources in some other part of our community, of social services, health care, particularly mental health. She goes on to say, the parliamentary budget officer has estimated that it costs $343,000 a year to keep one woman in federal custody. And provinces range, depending on the range of services and what is costed from a minimum of $30,000 to up in excess of $200,000. And what she pointed out is when we're talking about these kinds of costs to jail someone for non-payment for either a fine or a victim surcharge, it seems counterproductive at best. The essence of this, Mr. Speaker, is to suggest that when we remove judicial expression, which is the essence of this bill, what Bill C-37 does is two things. It doubles the percentage that's paid as a victim's fine surcharge from 15% to 30%. It imposes an automatic $100 on summary conviction and $200 an indictable offense. And the other most important ingredient, Mr. Speaker, that this bill does is to completely remove judicial discretion to waive these charges if it's in the opinion of the judge a situation where undue hardship will be occasioned due to the circumstances of the accused. Our current criminal code includes these words, Mr. Speaker under sec subsection 737.5, quote, when the offender establishes to the satisfaction of the court that undue hardship to the offender or the dependence of the offender would result from payment of the victim's surcharge, the court may, on application of the offender, make an order exempting the offender from the surcharge. This judicial discretion is completely removed, Mr. Speaker, under this act. The only judicial discretion that is allowed is judicial uh, discretion to increase the fine. But the ability to look at the accused and think, is this somebody who in the circumstances of their life has been a victim of crime themselves? Who through no fault of their own, and I think of the case of Ashley Smith for an example, all of us who watched what happened to that young woman recognize that she was less the actor in a criminal act and more through a, a series of horrific errors, a victim of incarceration and the impacts of incarceration that ultimately led to her death. Had she, and it would have been a much better circumstance, but someone in her circumstance has been released from prison and then at the same time been told, well, you still have to pay that fine. Where do you find the resources? How do you go on? Will you then end up having 
a counterproductive result, as the Elizabeth Fry Society says to us. I want to close, Mr. Speaker, with the advice of the Canadian Bar Association. They say, in our view, the proposed changes to increase victim fine surcharges beyond the reach of a greater number of people will lead to more defaults, more incarceration of the poor, and prevent judges from using their discretion to ensure a just result. Mr. Speaker, this legislation does not meet its objectives. Those who are victims of crimes should have access to adequate resources, but this is not the way to go about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Kestjoe Kamantayev. Is the Honorable Minister of Heritage standing for this purpose? I guess not. The Honorable Member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Okay, Mr. Speaker. As is often the uh, case, uh, the Honorable Member from Sandwich Gulf Islands has an unusual ability to integrate uh, details that many of us miss, uh, miss within a much broader context of social and, and legal, legal implications. Um, I learned a lot from what she just said. It concerns me as well. I'd just like her to uh, take this a little bit broader and talk not about the impact uh, of victims within prison walls, but upon their families and uh, what implications that may be for actually increasing the cost to society in a variety of ways. The Honorable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank my honorable friend from Thunder Bay, Superior North. That has been a concern of a number of the witnesses who testified before the committee. If a fine is levied against someone for a relatively minor offense and they lack the ability to pay, it essentially could recriminalize them, prevent them from being able to care for their dependents. I mean, that was one of the grounds that we are now uh, repealing, that a judge could have concern for whether there was undue hardship on the perpetrator of the crime or on their families. Uh, a, a summary conviction, just to, to remind, I remember this well, I was thinking of it earlier when the member for Cape Breton Canso spoke of the progress that's been made by the Mi'kmaq people of Wakaba. Years ago, I remember reading the story in the paper of the cr criminal conviction of a young man from uh, Wicogama nearby for the theft of a pizza from the local store. It was theft under, it was punishable by summary conviction. He had jail time. And uh, under this new law, he'd also be immediately fined $100, for which there would be absolutely no recourse. That's a mistake, Mr. Speaker. It will do damage to families, it will do damage to the individuals involved, and it will add nothing to the overall health and well-being of our society. Question and comments. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've been concerned for quite a while that um, even when there's legislation that most of us agree with and most of its parts, like this, all of us want to see adequate protection and, uh, if necessary, compensation for victims. But um, this government, the members of this government, virtually never vote for any amendments to any of their legislation. They apparently feel that uh, they, they have it perfectly. And so um, I'd just like to add the comment that the Honourable Member from uh, Sandwich Gulf Islands might want to add to, that I hope this is one time that they will consider a small amendment to an important piece of legislation to uh, prevent a, a big error and to improve the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd also like to urge that we could, at report stage, make amendments. This, in this case, as in most cases, we've seen efforts made at committee. I want to particularly note, and I've worked with him on this file, that our former Minister of Justice, who's currently the Liberal member for Mount Royal, has worked very hard on this as well and sees some of the same issues that I see. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that victim services are advanced if we create more people in prisons. What we do need to do, I completely support increasing the fine. I completely support that we make sure that we track the funds and make sure they're going to victim services from provinces. But it, uh, it certainly is wrong to remove judicial discretion because only a judge, having, test having watched an accused in a proceeding, having tested the evidence, and at the point of sentencing, has, I think, the ability to look at that accused person and decide whether applying the fine 
will be in the interests of public security and safety or counterproductive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.